Albert Einstein said that the only source of knowledge is experience. So it stands to reason that what you learn outside of school will be different than what you learn in the textbook, and that that will change how you view the world. And that certainly holds true for Stanley Rosen, a Brooklyn native who was a pre-med student at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in 1959, before he got interested in China. He then continued on to get his master's degree in political science at UCLA. And Stan has gotten a lot of experience in China since then. He first went to Taiwan in 1970, Hong Kong in 1971, and then he first visited the mainland in 1980 and has traveled back over 60 times. That accumulated knowledge is a real resource to his students at the University of Southern California, where he specializes in Chinese politics, society, and film. From the USC US China Institute, this is China Life, the podcast sharing the stories of people living and working in China. I'm your host, Craig Stewart. What got me interested in China was I had a professor who was Chinese who was teaching East Asia, and uh, that was the best class I had. And I got a degree in political science, a double major with English, and, and yeah, even though it took me five and a half years. So almost like just coincidence that, you know. Well, fortunate. I mean, I feel very fortunate that things up to, ended up the way they did. I would have been a disaster in medical school. So when you were at Chapel Hill and you took that first class that sort of introduced you to, about China, did you know much about China before then? No, uh, not really. I wish I had been more diligent during my college years. I played basketball. I played golf. I played tennis. So I wasn't really oriented. I still remember the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. I just come back, I think, from the golf course, and and uh, everybody was on the screen there. It looked like we we're going to go to war with Russia or something. I said, "What's up? What's up?" I said, "You know, uh, it looks like we may end up in a nuclear war." I said, "Oh, okay, but I have to have dinner first. <laughs> so I was not really oriented to world affairs, and that's one of the things China has done. Once I started studying political science in China, is to really get me interested in uh, world affairs. I read the New York Times and the LA Times, Washington Post every day very carefully. And that's really been a big change. And I wish I had started that way. And then uh, when you were at UCLA, what fascinated you about Chinese politics? Well, of course, I started in 65. It was the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. I think that was probably what became very exciting because all of this was going on and we didn't have a whole lot of information other than what was appearing originally in the Chinese newspapers. And one of the great sources in those days was the Japanese correspondents who could read Chinese characters and look Chinese to some extent, dressed like Chinese. And so they would go and read all the wall posters and write them down and publish it. And then it was translated by the American embassy in Tokyo in daily summary of the Japanese press. So we got information from that. And then all these secret documents uh, from the past leaked out from the Red Guards, uh, selectively leaking uh, Mao's former speeches and, and uh, other things about the Cultural Revolution. So it was, a, it was a time of great turmoil, in a sense, in the world, both in the U.S. with all the uh, anti-war movements going on, trying to figure out what's going on in Vietnam, trying to figure out what's going on with the Cultural Revolution in China. Sino-Soviet split was another issue. Yeah, so it was really a time of, of great interest uh, in terms of world affairs. You were kind of learning it as these, you know, phenomenally huge changes were yeah. going on in real time. Yeah, yeah, the student movement, police coming on campus. When I was a TA at UCLA, I had a post, a big poster of Mao in my cubicle. We didn't really have offices, just cubicles. And the police, of course, came to campus from time to time. And at one point, I noticed that my picture of Mao was defaced with a big X across his face. Really? It was written, pig power. Did that give you any pause? Did you think maybe this is not the, the no, right thing to I, be studying? Yeah, you have to remember the mentality of the times. No, it didn't give me pause at all. It was just a part of everyday life. And then when was the first time you went to China? I was studied in uh, Taiwan from December 1970 to June 71. That was my first trip to Taiwan. I was in Hong Kong from 1971 to 76 as part of my fellowship from the University of California system. I was required to teach at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I studied two years of Chinese. I studied Taiwan, six months of Chinese in Taiwan. I had studied a little bit in the U.S. at first. 
My first trip to mainland China, I was supposed to be there in 73 at, to the Canton Trade Fair, but uh, the person who invited me, she couldn't get enough visas, so I couldn't go. So I didn't get there till 1980 for the first time. I went twice in 1980, uh, once uh, through Macau to Guangzhou, and uh, the second time, uh, China International Travel, Ser Travel Service trip to Hangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai, various places like that. So, what did it feel like making that first step on the mainland? You know, the trip from Macau to Guangzhou in those days, there's no highway. We had to go through four ferries. The trip to Beijing, we had to stay in Tianjin because there's no hotel rooms in Beijing for us. And everything was on a very tight schedule. It took four hours to go from Tianjin to Beijing, and the highways were not good. So we got back at 1 a.m., got up at 5, and so we had 20 minutes, for example, the Temple of Heaven. And there's some people in our tour group who had prepared their entire lives to see the Temple of Heaven. They refused to leave after 20 minutes, they staged a sit-down strike and said, we demand to stay longer and we will sacrifice lunch, but we will not leave. And so they learned from the Cultural Revolution, I guess. And so they let us stay a little bit longer. But it was just the all new experiences, you know, the Great Wall, Forbidden City. I'm not much of a tourist and I'm more interested in watching people and looking at what's available for sale in the stores, that kind of thing. But it was, you know, an eye-opening experience in a sense. Although having studied China, unlike a lot of other people in, in the group, you know, it wasn't as big a surprise to me as it might have been to some people. Did it feel different after studying it for, you know, 15 years, Chinese politics, and then actually being there? It gave me a feeling, in which was repeated many times after that, that uh, China's obviously a big place, so a lot's going on. And you could be less than a mile away from some major event and wouldn't even know about it. I, mm. you know, I thought about that in 1985 when I was at the Friendship Store in September. And uh, when I got back to my hotel room in 85, somebody from Beijing University um, sent me a message saying, what did you think of the big demonstration in Tiananmen Square by the students? And I was maybe blocks away from that. And I had no idea it was happening. Mm. I, until I got back and they told me it was happening. So, I mean, it's just the scale of things. And it kind of put in mind to me that you can learn a lot more about China in a sense by not being there and by being outside and getting the information. Because it, if you're there, unless you're right on the scene, you're probably not going to know what's going on. You still teach about Chinese politics. I do. What do you think you try and teach your students based on your experiences now as opposed to in the 80s. Do you think that your opinions of China have changed over time? Yeah, I think my opinions have changed over time. I was a bit arrogant, I think, in those days. But over the years, I've developed an attitude. There are no real absolutes. Like, you have to qualify almost everything you say about China. Like every society and every political system, it's very, very complicated. I don't, I don't take extreme positions on any issue, hmm. I think, compared to what I might have back in the 80s. Do you think studying and teaching about China for so long, do you think China itself has impacted the way you teach now? Yeah, I think studying China, reading the Chinese media and spending a lot of time, you know, I've been there maybe 60 times. I don't know how many times. I, yeah, I think it's affected my teaching more generally, not dismissing any arguments completely out of hand unless they're, you know, obviously completely wrong. And I've done that before but I'm willing to listen to different kinds of arguments, uh, looking at the same data in, in different ways. What do you think caused that? Well, one thing is the humility of being wrong on a number of occasions and making predictions, uh, whether it's 1989 and Tiananmen Square and what was gonna happen after that, or you know, any number of other predictions about uh, what might or might not happen in China, not to mention what might or might not happen in US politics. Mm -hmm. Although I guess I'm one of the few people who, I shouldn't say this again, it's arrogant, but <laughs> that Donald Trump had a very good chance to win the election. I was trying to explain to some political pundits who were supposed to know these things very well during the Republican primaries that I'm really afraid of Donald Trump becoming the candidate and actually winning. And they dismissed me out of hand, as a lot of my friends did when I came back after studying the Cultural Revolution, my fellow graduate students who were so pro-China and misunderstanding of what was going on. Once I started doing refugee interviewing, interviewing 100 to 200 uh, Red Guards, for example, for my dissertation, I got a much better feel for daily life during the Cultural Revolution and, and also how people joined factions and 
And it wasn't just reading what was in People's Daily uh, or what the Chinese government wanted you to read. So you became much more nuanced. And you mentioned that you teach about Chinese film. Yeah, certainly it's something that I'm, I'm very interested in. I teach about it, and I also research it and write about it. What interests you in Chinese film? Well, that's another thing. I've always been interested in film since I got to college, I think more, although even as a kid, I would go to films all the time. When I got to college, I joined all these clubs, film clubs, and did the same thing in graduate school. And even in Hong Kong, I was a member of all these film clubs. And I gravitated, just as I gravitated toward uh, foreign students in college, I gravitated toward foreign language films. Uh, that was the high tide of, of foreign film invasion of the U.S. When, when the U.S., they still had the uh, Hayes Code, so you couldn't see the kinds of films. Censorship was very strong in the U.S. until the late 60s. And so foreign films were much more edgy. And so I'd go to see Fellini, Antonioni, Bergman, uh, you name it. So it was kind of a natural thing that I'd become interested in Chinese film. My first Chinese film I saw was when I was in Hong Kong in 1971. It was called Wajie Beizi, which uh, this life of mine was never been translated into English, that particular book, My Life as a Peking Policeman. I was so fascinated by that film because it was a history of 20th century China from a communist point of view. I was so fascinated by that film, never seen anything like it before. I went around to the, all the used bookstores in, in Hong Kong to try and find the original novel by Lao Shu, a very famous writer who committed suicide during the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Finally found it in, in, in a back uh, room in a bookstore in Mong Kok, uh, in, in Hong Kong, and I read it. And it, again, it was a, a shock to me because the book ends in 1924 whereas the film goes up to 1949. The book has nothing about communism in there. Mm. Um, it's just about an ordinary person trying to survive in the last part of the Manchu or Qing dynasty and then in the early years of the Republic. Uh, I mean, the Communist Party was only founded in 1921. The book ends in 24, nothing about communism. So they changed it completely to make it into uh, this person not realizing uh, how oppressed he was and he becomes tortured by the Nationalist Party, the Guomindang, and... At one point, he says to a cellmate who's a communist, who's there, he says, you know, I've always lived this great, good life. I mean, I've tried to be a good person. Why am I ending up in jail here? And the guy basically says, you're an idiot because you don't understand the nature of class forces in society and how you're exploited and you deserve to be where you are. That really opened my eyes both to film in China and also to the use of film for propaganda and how uh, original works are changed to meet the current revolutionary needs. And, and so I became, became interested in the politics of film at that point, I think. Uh, that film was very influential for me. When you watch Chinese films, do you enjoy watching them the same way you would enjoy a Hollywood film, or is it purely you know, like research? Well, that's a very good question, because when I, I went to see The Wandering Earth with a friend of mine, a Chinese friend of mine, you know, to me, in some ways, good, good or bad is irrelevant. Uh, what's the purpose of this film? What is it trying to tell us? Uh, why is the government promoting this film? So I'm looking at it from a research point of view. And of course, I can like films that other people don't like. You know, when I see The Great Wall, uh, I can see you know, many flaws in it, obviously, which uh, I talk about and written about. Um, but I'm interested in seeing why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, and what is the, what is the political purpose, um, and what is the social purpose, and the ideological purpose, and what are they selling here? Uh, why are they making a film? This is a, obviously a film made with a hundred seventy-five million or so dollar budget, uh, which is intended to be successful all over the world. So some of what they do is done for that purpose, and not done to make any logical, coherent sense as a story. So I, I accept that. And I don't criticize it on that basis other than uh, do they succeed or not in doing what they try to do. You're looking at it as, yeah, like a primary source. Yeah, like absolutely. What, what do you think pushes you to keep studying Chinese politics after all this time? Working on a subject like China, every day the newspaper is giving you new information, new data. It's changing all the time. You're not trying to find something new to say about Rousseau or Marx or you, but you're basically trying to figure out what's going on, and it becomes like a puzzle, a very interesting kind of puzzle. And then, you, you know, some people are trying to um, be influential, uh, educating uh, the public about China. I might, I might have had that feeling back during the Vietnam War days, certainly, but, 
but now I'm yeah to some extent I'm I'm doing that when I do media interviews, but and when I teach my class I'm trying to give people a feel for, you know you can't get to the essence of China I guess but give them a, a feel for what's important what do you need to understand to try and analyze China, you know you're trying to impart at least a way of thinking critical thinking to some extent. I'm open, as I tell people in the class, I'm open to all ideas, but I'd like, I don't accept what any government says at face value, whether it's the American government, the Chinese government, or any other government. Uh, governments lie. Governments um, basically have a point to make, uh, and they're going to do whatever is necessary to make that point, and more so now than ever before, I guess, under the current administration. Uh, it's winning. It's the only thing that counts. Um, but I'm going to try and teach you to do some critical thinking about this. Do you think studying China and, and going there so often, meeting so many people, has maybe informed you of what it means to generally be human? Yeah, but I, I don't know, but I think that's just true teaching at USC and having students from all over the world in your class. I taught a class on soft power this past semester, looking in a lot of different countries, and I had people there from Mexico and Italy, and New Zealand, China, uh, just a wide variety of cultures. and, and, and as we talked about different countries and, and, and soft power, we had a lot of good discussions, even arguments. And I can tell where people were coming from based on where they'd been. And I think USC has been very good in that regard because we have so many international students. And as I said, I've always been gra I've always gravitated toward international affairs even, and international cuisine. I love cuisines from all over the world because China is good for that. You go to China, you know you're going to eat well. So China's been part of that, but it's not just China. China Life is a production of the USC US China Institute. If you haven't yet, subscribe to China Life wherever you listen to podcasts to get all of our shows downloaded onto your listening device automatically. While you're there, leave us a review. It really helps other people find out about the show. To learn more about the USC US China Institute and browse our vast collection of resources, such as historical and contemporary documents, China based events around the US, author interviews, seminars for educators, and much more, visit our website at china.usc.edu. I'm Craig Steubing, and this is China Life.